Hey guys, this is John, and this is a quick tutorial on an essential Rook and Pawn versus Rook endgame. We're going to talk about short side versus long side today. Now, I've created a free repertoire on Chessable featuring this position and several other ones. So if you'd like to practice some of these need-to-know endgames, cruise on over to the site and do that. The link is in the description below. So, let's say we're playing white here. Black's Pawn is advancing towards the white king on C1. Now, if you identified this position as dangerous for white, you are absolutely right. And the reason why this position is dangerous is because the white king is going to be forced out from in front of the c-pawn. Normally as the side defending in such an endgame, you'd love if your king can stay in the path of the pawn to try to block it, but that is not the case here. And in fact, if it were black to move, black could just give a check, white would have to play king b2, and black goes c3, black is going to win. And even with white to move, as we're going to examine here, this position is tricky to hold. And the primary reason for that is that the black king can be shielded from checks by black's own pawn. The black king is perfectly placed to do that. White can check on d8 or a3. If white checks on a3, for instance, the pawn is going to advance to c3, and you see how white has run out of good checks to give, and now white is staring down the barrel of checkmated one. Not a good situation for white. White could play rook d8 check, but even in this case, the king goes to c3, White is still facing rook g1 checkmate, and white has to display this idea we're going to discuss in order to draw. So I think the easiest way to hold this position from the beginning is to play rook c8 to begin with. So we already identified that the checks have deficiencies, so we're going to get our rook behind the pawn. Now, if black were to push this pawn, this would be an easy draw right away. It's paradoxical, but it's true, because... After c3, now we can deliver this check from d8, and notice how the black king cannot hide in front of the black pawn anymore. Black can try to maneuver their king around, but really all black is going to be faced with is these checks from the white rook from behind. And black really wishes they could get this configuration. So after rook c8 from the beginning, black does not want to push the pawn, but they probably will play king c3 and use the shelter that the pawn is providing. I've heard this referred to as kind of hiding in the shade of the pawn. So now white is facing checkmated one, rook g1 mate. What should white do? This is an important point because there's two ways white can try to defend against checkmate, and they both involve moving the king. So king d1 or king b1. And if you've never studied these positions, I mean, you might as well just flip a coin, right? There's probably nothing you're going to be able to calculate unless you have like a lot of time and the ability to do so that will help you distinguish between these two squares. But one of those squares draws and one of them loses. And you just want to know off the top of your head which one is which. So first let's examine king d1. So let's say white flees this way. Well black will give a check. White will play king e2. And now black does need to get their c pawn going. So what black will do is play rook to c1. And this is a prelude to black moving their king, most likely to b2 if allowed. And unfortunately for white, there's not a really good way to oppose the advancing black pawn. Even though black has a bunch of pieces on the file right now, the king and the rook blocking the pawn, this pawn will advance. So even let's say white plays rook b8, trying to cut off the king on the b file, black will just play king here, maybe white will come back and attack the pawn, black will go here, White could even try to cut off the black king again, but black can play rook b1, offering a rook trade. Certainly white can't take black up on that rook trade because the c-pawn is just going to advance. And what you'll find is that eventually you will get into the Lucena position, or Lucena position, which I previously analyzed in this series. And this is a win for black. If the pawn gets that far with the king in front of it, this is winning. If you're not sure about why that is, go back and watch the Lucena video. So that's what white is facing right here, is this very real possibility that when the king runs, black is going to be able to advance this pawn, and white's king doesn't play any role in the defense. So in, in this position here, if white instead plays king b1, it's true that white's king will still not play a role in the defense against this advancing pawn, and black will probably play check, white will go to a2, and now let's say black does the same thing. So let's say black plays rook c1, trying to defend the pawn so the king is freed up to play king d2 and push the pawn. Now here, white has an important resource that was not possible in the other line. 
or that didn't work too well on the other line. So what White can do is play the Rook to h8. g8 would also work, but h8 is the most principled move. In preparation for side checks. So now if Black were to move the King here, we're going to check from the side. Rook h2 check. Let's say Black plays King d3. Black's ready to advance the pawn next move. We're going to deliver another check. King back to d2, check. Even King d1 will check. And you can see that the great distance that exists between the white rook and the black king enables white to give a ton of checks before the black king is able to attack the rook. In order to attack the rook, black's king is going to have to go way far over, right? You know, we'll get a situation like this. And when the king separates itself from the pawn by that great of a distance, now white's king is going to slide over. White's going to make an easy draw here. The rook will be forced away somewhere. White can just step in front of the pawn. Yeah, black's king is way too far. No chance that black wins this. So when we're talking about short side versus long side, this is what is meant. So if we go back to that critical position where white faced that decision between king d1 and king b1, this is short side versus long side right here. And what that refers to is if you take the pawn that you're facing and you draw an imaginary line to the edge of the board on each side, the shorter of the two lines, so in this case, the line going from the C file to the A file, that's the side you want to go to with your king. So you're the defending side here. You want to go to the short side with your king, king B1. And you're going to leave the so-called long side, the C file through the H file, available to your rook so you can deliver those side checks. So king to the short side, rook to the long side. That's what you want to burn into your brain. And as I already demonstrated, black cannot win this. There's some ways that black can try to finagle this position and maybe trick white, but if white always remembers that this resource is available, bringing the rook to the long side where there's maximum checking distance between the white rook and the black king, black will not be able to win. One other thing I want to point out is if black tries to play a move like king d3, for instance, so not playing rook c1 and instead just moving the king immediately to push the pawn, I think you could technically still play this move and get away with it, but probably easier is just to play king b2. You move your king over, and notice how the king and the rook are coordinating to stop the advance of the pawn to c3. So this is a device you'll sometimes be able to employ in a king and rook and pawn versus king and rook endgame to hold. And black might give a check, you'll play the king back to c1, and we have a position from before. We've actually just got uh, the starting position after white played rook to c8. Remember that pawn to c3 will just result in this cascade of checks. Black has no shelter for the king. Draw. And if black plays king c3, we already know the, re the right move at this point. And if you don't, you haven't been paying attention to this video. <laughs> so, yeah, king b1, check, king here. Let's say this rook c1 move, which really requires white to demonstrate why the rook belongs on the long side. So then white just goes over here, and we're going to deliver these side checks. One final point, because I think I did not mention this, but if we go to the long side with the king, if we mistakenly go to the long side with the king again, so king d1, check, here, and rook here. I was mentioning what might try rook b8, but here, this really illustrates why the, the checking distance between the defending side's rook and the superior side's king is important. So if white were to play rook a8 here, hoping to check from the side, I think you can quickly see that white will not have any of those checks available. So black will just play king b2. And if there was more space over here, white would love to be able to move the rook somewhere in this vicinity that I'm pointing to off camera so we could deliver checks down on, you know, the second, third, first rank. But there's just, there's nowhere to go. White gets cut off by the side of the board. So white's kind of resorting to these checks down the file, but that's just going to allow the pawn to advance very slowly. Also, if white were to go this way, and try to deliver checks from the side, it doesn't work because their own king is in the way. That's not going to bother black at all, right? I mean, if white does something like this, it's not a check and black will just continue to advance. So that's what people mean when they talk about short side versus long side. So as the defending side, it's always king to the short side, rook to the long side. Final thing I want to say, this is a basically last ditch attempt to try to draw a position. It's a very important drawing technique, but if you can avoid king to the short side, rook to the long side, that's usually best. I mentioned this right at the start of the video, but it's worth repeating. You don't really want to fall into these positions where your king is forced 
out from uh, in front of the pawn because that increases the chance that you're going to lose. But if you know this short side versus long side idea, you can still hold the position. Anyways, like I said, you can practice this position and other essential rook end games on Chessable. And thanks for watching, guys. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye.